Uh, you've all been relatively prepped with kind of some questions and things today, but uh, I'm going to start off. You, go, you have both worked with fairly high-level organizations. I mean, Debbie, you've worked with a lot of top flight rugby. Uh, Megan, you've worked with the ECB. I mean, now you've both done work with anti-doping. And so I'll ask the same question for both of you, and Megan, if you could start. Who is the most famous person that you've met so far while studying <laughs> them? And uh, what's it like working with top-level athletes while studying them instead of maybe coaching them, which is a, something we're a little bit more familiar with? Um, a really great question. I'm not normally um, a name dropper, or an equally, I'm not a kind of person that's starstruck by individuals very easily. So as part of my PhD research, I actually spoke to the majority of um, Olympic sports who would have competed at Tokyo. Um, so watching Tokyo myself, there was a lot of faces that I was like, oh, I've actually met them before, that's really nice, because I know a bit about their story beyond just their performance um, on that day. Um, but I think what's important is when I did research them and um, speak with them, they were involved with my um, focus group discussions. I didn't necessarily um, see, I saw them as being a, a normal person. Um, we are on the same level and there's no hierarchy within our discussions. And I feel like because of that, it's um, what le led to a good relationship and rapport that I built with them when speaking with them and truly understanding their experience because I didn't put them on a pedestal um, and then probably a realization for me later down the line when I saw them on TV I then was like oh actually yeah they are pretty famous aren't they <laughs> so retrospect retrospectively appreciated that and I think that's a good a good way to be when working with um, people we all want to be treated um, normally right mm. So I didn't answer. I didn't answer your question intention, intentionally. So I don't want to. I don't want to name drop, and I want to hold true to, to that. <laughs> no, I'm quite similar to Megan in that um, I've never really seen myself as working with um, famous people, if you like, because you're just part of that environment. You're part of the mm. team, and um, so you're just all working together to achieve that same goal. So you. you Sometimes, like I said, when you do actually see them on the telly, you're like, oh my goodness, yeah, actually, yeah. take a step yeah. back. You, you do work with these people, it's really cool. Um, so you might have noticed that my work is, um, my research when I did my PhD was in rugby. And you'll see the affiliations on there, but it does say um, that I worked with um, Leeds Rugby, um, which was Leeds Rhinos in Yorkshire Carnegie at the time. Um, so, I'll go a bit controversial, I'll, I'll name, yeah, name drop name one. Drop. <laughs> um, so, someone who's doing amazing things for motor neuron disease at the moment, hopefully you were Kevin Sinfield, so I worked very closely with him. And um, some of the big names that are all kind of starting to retire now um, in Leeds Rugby, but there are people like Jamie Peacock and Jamie Jones Cannon and people like that that I worked alongside. So they're all really great people and are still doing great things, even though some of them might have retired now. Who's that to? Either of us. Sorry, I didn't quite hear. Was it, it's it's your yeah, ego. Yeah. You want to repeat the question, yeah, sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I think sports people, they want to be better, they want to win, and they want to do what is going to make them win. So I think it's like Megan mentioned earlier, it's not about that hierarchy, like I'm telling you what to do, it's about working together. Mm -hmm. um, to make goals, to change their nutrition practices and improve their nutrition knowledge. So there was never um, that thing of, I know what I'm doing, I'm already good at this, I don't mm. need to listen to you. We, we all kind of work together. And so I've never experienced any egos getting in the way of working with athletes. From, from my experience, I've definitely come across people with with egos in the sense of, you know, they've been in the sport for a very long time. Um, they're quite, historically, it's the athletes that are a bit older um, than myself as a practitioner, and therefore they do have a lot of life experience, life experience within sport, but also with outside of sport as well. And, and so for me, especially early on in my career, I did find working with those individuals quite challenging um, and probably quite intimidating sometimes in places um, because of their experience. 
Um, so I think as I've got uh, older and more confident in my ability, uh, that has definitely become something that it, I find more manageable and doesn't probably overwhelm me as much, um, just because I'm more confident in my ability because of my experience. Um, but equally, I think when working with those types of athletes, the relationship is always a priority. So what can be really um, impactful is rather than going in and trying to pretend to be the expert and give this person advice who perceives that they probably already know that advice, is actually just spending time developing a relationship with them on more of an, uh, a personal level. Um, because when you're trying to work with people and change their behaviour, um, the relationship is the most important and, and impactful thing you can do there. So it's time that's never wasted. It's time just more focused specifically on the relationship rather than giving nutritional advice um, and when that relationship is developed and they trust you that you've got a bit of credibility because of that then it's finding the right time to then move forward with the advice when the time is appropriate. But when I first started working down at the rugby um, sometimes all I do was I just go and hang around in the gym and I wasn't really giving any nutrition advice as such. I was just hanging around and like Megan said, developing those relationships. And then you get to the point where at the end of a training session, someone would come up to you and ask you a question like, oh, well, what do you think to this? And then you'd start mm. kind of, th that's how it would start. And then someone hears, oh, well, oh, they've started working with Debbie and, and learning about this and, and doing this now. And then because I was in a team environment, word gets around. Yeah. <laughs> They um, want to get involved. <laughs> yeah, sometimes starting in those environments, I found the same as Megan. It's just going and integrating and yeah. having a chat with people, building rapport. Yeah, well, we know that change of behaviour is very difficult and it's a phenomenon that we haven't yet decided, uh, haven't yet worked out to address and that's because as, as humans there's so many factors that influence our behaviour and we're all so different to each other as well, um, so one side doesn't fit all and equally as people we change over time as well, so what perhaps was a priority to us one day might be a different, different the next day and so I feel when working with people, and this is the biggest message from my research, is that we must take time to understand the person and not make assumptions and um, based on our own experiences of what we think that they need or what we think that their barriers are. Um, I think, again, linking back to the previous question, I think when you come in a, a, a sport as a new inexperienced practitioner, you kind of feel like you have to be the expert and you need to go in and start giving them advice to almost give yourself credibility uh, to validate yourself um, as a practitioner but actually as sports scientists pr practitioners we need to spend more time de developing interventions in partnership with our athletes um, rather than delivering interventions on them to them and so the first part of that is to spend time getting to know the athlete and understanding um, them as people their, what they find easy what they find difficult um, so really seeking to understand and it's, in t it's not, not until we can do that when we'll be effective in actually changing the behaviour because otherwise we come in and we we're just targeting the wrong things in the wrong way. So we need to be asking the right questions in the right way to truly understand them because understanding them um, accurately depends on whether the success of whether you can change a behaviour. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Should I go first? Yeah. 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 Um, so I think I went into sports nutrition rather than working as a, a, a nutritionist within the general population because I was under the assumption 
that working with athletes would probably be easier because they'd be so motivated by the performance they would really want to um, take on any advice because they want to win, they want to be the best. But then I soon realised through my applied work but from my research that athletes are like humans, like us, um, like normal people um, and actually being, being motivated by performance, so being within a performance driven environment can actually cause, um, can make it more difficult to adhere because we fixate so much on performance and it being so important that that, that, that overplayed can be really detrimental to our, our health and well-being in the sense that we feel like we need to be really dedicated and in, in the context of nutrition meaning really restrictive of our intake and that's a marker of being motivated and being good but that you know we can't be on as an, an athlete shared with me in my research you know being, being, a, you're, being a human, nobody can be that motivated 365 days of the year. And therefore what we find is athletes are really motivated in the lead up to competition. Um, but because that's such a, a, a difficult time for them mentally to be so restrictive with their nutritional intake, then after that competition has been done, they go completely the other way. Um, and that's where we see lots of fluctuations in restrictive eating and then maybe binge eating, rather than having a really healthy, well-balanced relationship with food that's kind of consistent. And as part of that, you know, athletes allowing themselves to have a break in their um, nutritional adherence, whereby you know, they can go out and have a McDonald's, they can have a, a pizza and have a couple of beers at the weekend if they want to. Like, that's not going to have a massive impact on their performance and doesn't make them a bad athlete. It makes them human. And if, we, if they can be more consistent with that, they can be more motivated over time. Um, so that's often my role as a nutritionist is working with them to understand that so they can have a better more consistent relationship with food and and a positive adherence so from my perspective working in rugby um, you'll have seen from the research paper that using gold standard measures so the, the best measure we've got in nutrition to measure someone's energy expenditure it costs a thousand pounds per player so I gave them water that cost 500 pounds each to drink and then there's the analysis on top. So it cost nearly £30,000 to do that study that um, I shared with you. And it showed that the highest energy expenditure of a rugby player was 7,600 calories. So as you can imagine, so it's not that hard to try and tell rugby players to eat more when they're expending that kind of energy. Um, but it, is it Jack, Jake? You mentioned that um, you pulled out the bit about physical development as well. And um, a lot of my research was with adolescent rugby players. And actually, some of them really, really struggled to meet their high energy expenditure. Some of those needed, on average, 4,500 calories per day. Um, so actually, it wasn't that they didn't want to do what I was saying. And like Megan mentioned, there's so many other things in life that gets in the way, um, not to mention someone's motivation to constantly try and be thinking, oh, I need to eat this amount of carbohydrates, this amount of fat, this amount of protein, because in rugby, they all want to get bigger because momentum helps with the collisions and win the game. So I actually had a lot of athletes struggle because physically they felt like they couldn't eat the amount of food that they needed mm. to Firstly, just maintain their energy balance, so stay that same body weight to be able to play. And then you've got adolescent players who want to get bigger, so they really struggled. So we had to work really hard to try and find strategies to help them eat more. Um, so yeah, I'd say it was uh, physical development and growing rugby players with a high energy expenditure from collisions. Um, it's challenging to work with in that they feel like they can't always physically do it. Mm. Yeah, great question. So I think um, as a student athlete, there's a lot of other things going on and a lot of other influences on someone's dietary intake. We know that there's nights out, there's probably a lot more alcohol involved than a professional level rugby player. Um, you, know, you've got, you hear things all the time about students staying up late um, to try and get assignments in as well as work as well um, as train. Um, so I think there's probably a lot of good practice 
that students could take from professional rugby players. And I'm not saying that professional rugby players are perfect all the time either. Um, you know, they all have um, different uh, barriers to having a good diet as well. Um, but I certainly think there's a lot that student athletes could learn. Um, we're actually, um, we've just been in a meeting before we came here, Megan and I, about um, the high supplement use in um, student athlete populations. And, you know, they are prevalent in rugby, things like protein and creatine, because they're the kind of supplements that seem to be helping build muscle mass. Um, but if you don't have a good diet first, then actually we question, are they doing much for us? And we're actually going to start looking at some of that with, um, for example, Leeds Beckett Rugby and some of the other um, athletes um, around um, good nutrition intake and supplement intake and trying to kind of make it a bit better with what you might see with professional players. Okay, yeah, good question. So there's, um, I guess throughout your lifestyle, there's a lot of things that can um, influence your dietary intake. And I think adolescence, so kind of um, when someone's growing and developing and it's defined as when they hit, um, have gone through puberty that they become an adult. And I think um, that's a massive stage in life where you're developing autonomy. So the ability to make your own choices. So you know, you might start with a 14-year-old athlete who is now at high school and they're getting their own dinner money. Um, as an athlete, their friends might be going and buying multi-packs of crisps or going to the local chippy, but they've got to be able to make that decision. Well, do I eat for my performance? I've got training later. Or do I just go and buy that multi-pack of Doritos as well? And so autonomy is a massive factor. Um, but also there's growth spurts, so we know at the age of 14, most players reach what we term their peak height velocity, so they're the fastest um, growth spurt, um, but they've got another one that comes later on as well, so there's growing and developing as well as having more autonomy as well. Um, and I mean, Megan could probably talk to you about a lot of influences on dietary intake better than I can, but they're some of the key ones that I've seen in adolescence and the reasons why I think it's really important. That is really a contemporary issue that I think we're coming up a lot within high performance sport and you guys might have seen um, a lot of um, stories in the media of athletes coming forward um, and speaking about their bad experiences of um, being in a high performance environment where there was, that perhaps was putting them at risk of having an eating disorder or disordered eating and challenging their relationship with food and, um, and ultimately, in short, yes, our, we know our environment can massively um, stimulate, um, have a positive or a negative impact on our behaviour. And what, we, what, we've, what we're finding in um, sport is environments whereby there's a really attentive focus on body weight and body composition um, can actually be really unhealthy for some athletes in the sense that they become so fixated on the outcome, i.e. weight loss or um, weight, um, fat loss, that they start to follow behaviours that are actually conducive to their health and performance. So they start skipping meals and overall just having a restrictive energy intake. So that can be fueled by, yes, the environment. So I was, I was putting too much emphasis and focus on, the, um, on body weight, which can be um, played out in how regularly sports ask their athletes to weigh themselves. Um, so the frequency of that. It, Perhaps they're not being a strong rationale to explain to the athlete if that's needed. Sometimes it's not, but they still do it. Um, but then also thinking about people within that environment as well. So how much um, coaches or more broadly athlete support personnel um, make comments on the way that an athlete looks. Um, for example, um, commenting on, you know, even if it's in a positive way, that they might have lost weight or got leaner. 
that these are all sort of behaviours within the environment where we see that is actually just make heightening that as being something that should the athlete should perceive as being really important and, and that's where the risk is um, so as a practitioner a lot of our work and I'm really lucky within the, um, the sport that I work in that we have a really good culture around this but as a practitioner it's trying to shift the emphasis away from the outcome so body composition and actually focus on the dietary behavior because if we focus on the dietary